I have a question here that says, I rented a garden flat. I paid the full deposit and one month's worth of rent prior to moving in. No entry inspection was ever carried out. I had no contract with the landlord and I paid rent via EFT, but did not receive a receipt from the landlord. On the 4th of August this year, I gave notice as I could no longer afford the rent. I moved out on the 27th of, uh, of August. Before leaving, I requested that an exit inspection be carried out, which was refused by the landlord. A time for the inspection was set, but I could not attend due to transport concerns. So sorry, it was refused when I wanted it, but it was then uh, you know, set for a time where I was not available. The landlord now refuses to refund my deposit, saying I must take them to court. I did take photos of everything, meaning the condition of the, of the, of the property after I cleaned it. And further to this, I discovered that the deposit wasn't invested in an interest bearing account. And the landlord did not declare the income from the flat to SARS. What are my rights in this regard? And can I approach the small claims court? Solna? Your first list viewers gave us basically a list of questions that can keep us busy, like the entire, we can do this for this one episode. So let's start at the very beginning. And I'm going to try and break it down. So Bruno, please let me know where I've dropped. Okay, so will, will you will you be the, uh, you know, Hansi and Hricky pick up the breadcrumbs as I as I miss it. So, so sure. the starting point is actually um, the question says that there was no lease agreement, but uh, no contract between the, the landlord and the tenant. But there was rent paid and there was deposit paid. Now, very important is a lease agreement does not have to be in writing. The Rental Housing Act requires a lease agreement only to be in writing when the tenant requests the landlord to reduce it to writing. Other than that, the parties are allowed to contract verbally or even passively. And to be quite honest, um, there must have been some of the other verbal agreement between this landlord and the tenant. You don't just randomly move into a property and EFT money, luckily, into the right banking account. And, and if you have that kind of powers of knowing, feeling banking details, call me, I very often need to find banking details if I try and collect rent for clients. So it's unlikely that there wasn't any formal communication, even an email to get or a WhatsApp to get the banking details across. The parties agreed to the property. They've agreed to the amount of rent. They've agreed that the tenant will have undisturbed use and enjoyment of the premises. And that ticks all the boxes of the essential of the lease agreement. And for that reason, there was a lease agreement in place, even though it was verbal. Uh, just a side note, the, the Rental Housing Amendment Act, um, which hasn't been promulgated yet, uh, would require lease agreements to be in writing, but that was already published on the 15th of November, 2015. So I don't see that just have that promulgation just suddenly happening. Um, we're going to have to wait and see. But once that is promulgated, a lease agreement will have to be in writing. But still, as the tenant, you will have the benefit of the landlord's failure to conclude a lease agreement. So it won't just be like, no, nah, there was no agreement signed, not in compliance with the Rental Housing Act. So, OK, I'm just going to stay here for an event. If it's not going to be like that. But it's important to keep that in mind. So with, with this having been said, there was a lease agreement concluded. The tenant performed in terms of that agreement, that verbal agreement, by paying the rent and the first month's deposit. Now, the Rental Housing Act regulation, not the Rental Housing Act, the regulations to the Rental Housing Act, Regulation 4 specifically, says if a lease agreement wasn't signed, but the tenant paid the first month's rent and were allowed to take occupation, that is deemed to have been signed and delivered to the other party. So the regulations tell us this contract was fully concluded. 
the act also requires inspection. The problem is the reason for the inspections to the premises is actually more to the benefit of the tenant than the landlord. When used correctly, it is very much to the benefit of the landlord. But what the act says is, if there was no inspection concluded, it's deemed that the, that, the ten, that the property was in a good condition. However, if the tenant did not, if the landlord refused um, to have this inspection, there would be no way of proving that the property was in fact in perfect condition. So there's no way of proving that the tenant is responsible for, for defects and damage to the property. So the landlord effectively loses his entire claim for damage to the property by not doing an entry inspection. And then on the exit inspection, um, the fact that the parties agreed to a time and a place and the tenant didn't arrive, even though the tenant might have had a good excuse, the Act says if there was an inspection arranged and one party does not attend the inspection, the other party may do the inspection, record it complete, and it would be deemed that both parties were present at the inspection. So this is very important also um, for, for our other viewers to keep in mind, if you are the agent or you are the landlord and you struggle to get hold of the tenant and you finally get a date and a time for the inspection, you get there and the tenant doesn't pitch up, you can do the inspection, but my advice on that is take every single photo in as much detail as you can, record your full inspection properly, and you would still be able to then deduct all the damages from the deposit. Now, in this particular scenario, I think it, it was, um, wasn't was done on either side properly, to be quite honest, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to be frank, but I think it's important for tenants to also be aware of this. You also have a responsibility to attend the inspection if it was arranged. And if you don't, unfortunately, the landlord may proceed without you. And it's then deemed that you have been present and agree to everything. The fact that this landlord is now keeping the full deposit, this does not make sense to me because the problem is there wasn't an entry inspection. If there was an entry inspection, an exit inspection that reflected some damages, the landlord would have been able to retain some of the portions of the deposit, but only to the actual value of the repairs. And remember, the deposit has to be refunded if there's no damage within seven days uh, from termination of the agreement. And if there were damages within 14 days of restoration. And then there's a requirement on the um, landlord to provide the receipts of the repairs to the tenant to reflect, this was what was done, choo, 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 choo. this is what we've deducted, and then you have to refund the um, remainder of the deposit. So as far as the landlords retaining the full deposit, that doesn't sound right at all, especially considering there was no incoming inspection. With regards to the uh, deposit not being declared to SARS, a, I am a little concerned as to how this came to the um, tenant's knowledge without uh, contravening some privacy rights, but be that as it may, um, uh, uh, it could be that your resource official and then, you know, uh, but uh, regardless of how that happened, keep in mind that um, your deposit isn't seen as income to the landlord. So it's not an income taxable thing. You have to keep that money, even if it is in your normal account, as long as it is with a financial institution, carrying a minimum um, interest rate of what you would get at a normal financial institution. So not Luna, we can't invest deposits in, um, in Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies that does not tick the boxes um, at all for the requirements on the Rental Housing Act. But as long as you can show that there was interest, minimum interest, as you would get in a savings account, happy with that. But the fact that it wasn't declared to source um, is really irrelevant to the, to the conversation for the simple reason that it isn't a taxable income because the deposit that the landlord received isn't an income. It is money to be held 
but it still belongs to the tenant. Ownership of that only transfers at the end when uh, the receipts are delivered and uh, the money is now going to the landlord. Woo! Did I get almost everything, Bruno? How many crumbs did I leave? Almost. I think maybe three. So good job. <laughs> well done. Okay. It's because I'm almost all there and wiser. Bruno, can we, can we hear about those crumbs? Okay, cool. So, uh, but it's very small stuff. Uh, so, um, Sonna dealt with uh, whether the agreement needs to be in writing or not. She dealt comprehensively with the inspection. So, that's a big one in this case. Um, the deposit being invested, uh, she also dealt with now. So, that's actually a crumb she dealt with right at the end. Um, the only variation to the answer is um, with respect to the retention of the deposit is if this lease is being terminated early. I didn't actually get that from the question. It feels like it was a long time ago. Um, so if, if, the, if it was an early termination, then the grounds for retention could be more than just damage to the property. It could be the argument that, you know, they didn't give proper notice or that there were still time periods left on the lease or something along those lines. Obviously, the lease not being in writing makes it very difficult. Um, so another thing that I'd consider is the fact that the lease wasn't signed may differ from the lease not being in writing because there could be a situation where the lease was engaged upon the parties were aware of the terms, but they simply didn't sign it, meaning that the terms are recorded somewhere and, you know, certain provisions could be in there. Uh, so, you know, that, that, and that's the difference between a tacit lease agreement where a person moves in, pays the amount and they're, they're a tenant um, and like the industry norms of a lease apply where arguably, you know, it could even be a month to month lease or maybe there were terms that were agreed to tacitly accepted by the person moving in. So yeah, that could be another reason for the retention of the deposit. Um, and I think, yeah, I think the, the last thing was with SARS. I agree with someone that's a very strange uh, like fact to kind of stumble across. So short of a landlord actually admitting that they don't declare their rent to SARS. Ah, yeah, they don't declare their income to SARS. It's a bit of a weird one how how they're sure about this. And sometimes I find that certain presumptions are made. So just be very careful uh, before you start rocking the boat. But um, to, to add on what Solna says, the income, so the actual rent would have to be declared to SARS, the deposit not. So, but yeah, also remember that you only declare your income at a certain point in the year. So you don't do it on a monthly basis. Uh, so it's only when you file your returns. So if this was a recent incident, it's unlikely that anyone would have been filing returns uh, regarding this rent, um, at least during the course of this year. Thanks, Bruno. Thanks, Alana. Just one quick question then, with regard to the SARS information, what, what good would that do for a tenant in any event? I mean, what could they use it for? What would they do with it? Uh, it's not, doesn't sound like something that could be used it's by revenge. a Revenge. It's revenge. <laughs> it's getting someone into yeah. trouble. Yeah. I wanted I to say extortion. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to extortion. say extortion. Like, I mean, but but I don't think it's the wisest move mm. to mm. commit a crime because your landlord irritated you. Oh. I would be a little, I would be a little, you know, I, nobody looks good in like solid orange jumpsuits. <laughs> <laughs> um, Speak for yourself, so that I look, I look good <laughs> with the, like the, the bald hair. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, guys. I'm way too pretty for jail. I'm sorry. I don't do orange. <laughs> <laughs> oh guys thank you for that maybe, maybe just to actually wrap up because the one thing we we actually forgot about is the qu the question is very loaded uh recourse uh small claims court yes uh rental housing tribunal oh. yeah a lot uh, a lot um a better idea because they actually deal with this um and they've got the processes and yeah, approaching an attorney for a deposit will probably land up being quite expensive so i normally ask the client uh, the clients that are tenants that if it's just the claim of a deposit um rather go to the rental housing tribunal it's uh, it's mm. yeah less expensive 